So it's been a few months since we've talked about the mini trucks. Biscuit's been doing great and we haven't really had any problems with it. I just haven't had a chance to edit any of the videos on the upgrades we've been doing to him. Kiki, on the other hand, has been a bit of a problem. As you remember when we first got it, the fuel pump wasn't working. And then after we got the fuel pump working, there were a few other issues to work out. So far, one of the biggest questions I get when we're talking about these imported Japanese cars is how hard are they to work on and how hard is it to source parts for the vehicles? So far, every time a fix has been needed for my mini truck, it's been no problem. A little bit of research, a little bit of parts hunting, but I've been able to find every part that was needed or at least a passable interchange to part. But these trucks are getting old and sometimes you have to get creative and then sometimes you're just going to be out of luck. And that almost happened to me. So back in the last Kiki video, you remember when we tried to get the car from port? It wouldn't run. So we start with the cheap stuff first. The battery was dead, so we charged it up to see if that was the problem. When that didn't help, I pulled the air cleaner and sprayed some starter fluid in it just to see if it would get it to turn over. And it did for a few seconds and then it would stop running. Yay! So then I suspected maybe I was just low on gas. The gauge showed that I had a half full tank, but maybe that was inaccurate. So I filled up the tank with some jerry cans. We tried some more starter fluid, and still nothing. Alright, so I picked up two gallons of gas, and I tried that and that didn't work. So I went through a full diagnostic to figure out what was wrong. So with every car, it starts with three things. Fuel, spark, and air. One of these things was not functioning like it was supposed to. I usually try to start with the cheapest fix first and then work my way up to the expensive stuff. There's no sense in putting an expensive part in when it turns out to be a $5 relay. So now with your fueling issue, you pretty much have either bad gas or a bad fuel filter or a bad fuel pump or your fuel injectors might be clogged or faulty. Or you have a combination of multiple or all of these issues. Now your fuel pump could be electrical or it could be mechanical. In most electrical setups, there's also probably a computer and a relay that could also be the root cause. Now luckily I was able to download a translated parts manual and a factory service manual for my truck and van. I got that off the Suzuki owners forum. I highly suggest looking up one of these for your car, it's basically a cheat sheet for how to troubleshoot your vehicle. Now after looking through the manual, it shows for my specific setup, which is a van automatic turbo configuration, the fueling system has a relay that's activated by the computer. It tells the electronic fuel pump when to turn on. When I first attempted to start the car, I heard something turn on, but it turned out to just be a fan for a seat heater. I didn't actually hear the electric fuel pump running. Usually, if you pay attention, you can hear your fuel pump turn on for a few seconds when you turn your key. That's the typical priming procedure for pretty much every electrical pump. This maintains the necessary fuel pressure once you start the car. So the next steps are we are going to check the uh, fuel relay and see if that will help get this little guy started. Okay, so I downloaded a copy of the factory service manual for the van. Um, it's actually almost identical to the one I have for the truck. Um, in fact, there's a lot of references to the truck in there as well. But uh, because the van is fuel injected and turbocharged, there's some different instructions and different troubleshooting for it. So what we're going to do is uh, go through the list and figure out what's wrong. I was able to get the van to turn over and start with starter fluid being sprayed into the intake so um, and it ran as long as I kept spraying so that leads me to think that it's either um, something actually wrong with either the fuel pump or the fuel pump relay so it looks like the relay or the fuel pump is this guy right here I have no idea how to get that out of there I think I have to undo these two screws and then I should be able to slide this whole harness bracket out Kind of a stupid little design there. One of the more frustrating things about working on Japanese cars is that a lot of the Phillips head screws aren't actually Phillips heads. Um, I think they call them like J2s or J-somethings. Um, what they are is actually a screw. It's a Phillips head shape, but it's a little shallower. Um, and so if you don't have the right type of tip on your screwdriver, you tend to just strip the screws out. So, And I keep trying to order a set of them, and I keep forgetting to. So. See if I can get this out without screwing up all the heads of them. Okay, so that worked great. I took these two little screws out and I was able to get this whole harness uh, bracket out. Um, and now we're going to take this center fuel relay and test it. I was actually mistaken. It's actually this relay that we're going to be testing for the fuel pump. What it wants us to do is check between C and D 
or we have our test meter set to ohms. We're going to touch these two coil sides together. And this should be between 60 and 80 for a turbocharged engine, and it is 71. So we are right within range. Then what we're going to do is put a 12 volt source on that same line and then look to see what kind of power we're getting between uh, C and D, which should be zero. Okay, so I tested out this relay and it, everything is showing up okay with it. When I hook 12 volts to it, I hear it click over and there's ohms between the A and B terminals once that's done. So I'm pretty sure that that relay is fine and not our issue. Since I didn't hear the fuel pump turn on, but the relays are doing what they're supposed to do, that leads me to think that it is a fuel pump. So rather than jump to a fuel filter or some other item, we're going to start there. Okay, so I'm sure there's more stuff up top, but from what it looks like is there's the uh, filler neck attachment here, and then there's a bolt here, and a bolt on the back side. Somewhere around there. We'll get those two bolts off. And I think the tank will drop. I don't know. We'll find out. Those two or three bolts plus a filler neck allow me to lower the tank enough to get on top of the tank where I was able to then disconnect the other fuel lines and electrical lines running into the fuel tank. This disconnects the fuel pump and the sending unit. It's kind of tight in here, but I got it all disconnected. Unfortunately, while I was troubleshooting, I just assumed we were out of gas, so I added quite a few gallons and now I have a very full, very heavy tank. So after I dropped the tank, I drained the gas out into some jerry cans. Okay, so we extracted the gas tank and we're going to pull the pump out. Sending unit I think is working fine. It looked like it had, uh, it was getting a signal when I last checked everything. Once the gas tank was empty enough, I went through the process of removing and disassembling the fuel pump. It was a rusty mess, so this is most likely my issue. So I got to get another pump. Okay, so here is the pump. You see, it's uh, a little rusty, a little shitty. Uh, probably bad. Probably our problem. Uh, I'm also going to maybe pop a 12 volt source on it and just see what happens. Uh, but in the meantime, let's assume that this is our problem child. So here's where finding parts for old cars becomes a little tricky. I searched for the part number that my parts manual gave me, and apparently this part is discontinued. But it's replaced by another, which is also discontinued. But then that's replaced by another one, and along down the line. But it seems like this is the same basic pump that's used in a Hayabusa and a lot of other Suzuki bike products. The pump itself looks almost identical, but it has a slightly different inlet, and the pickup options are a little different, and the plug connector is a little different. But other than that, it's basically the same part. So I decided to order a nice, high-quality $80 Hayabusa part. Now I just have to move some of the components from the old pump to the new pump. Okay, so here's the old pump. I also saw another YouTuber who had done a similar conversion. And he had used this as well. So you can see those two units there. Pretty similar. Um, I don't know if I need this pickup and the sock that's on the bottom of that fuel pump, but we'll figure that out. So in the meantime, let's get everything exposed here and see what we got. So here is a sock. Here is another type of sock. Here is another sock. I guess these are used for multiple different applications. So uh, here is the piece that goes on the bottom. Attach all that. Replace this one. Um, so let's start taking this one apart and then we'll see what we can swap over. And what we can do. I'd also heard that it was possible to cut this or to jam this in here. We'll see if we can get the fitting off of there to do that. Um, or use one of these or something, but otherwise we'll get the sucker to fit in there somehow. Two seconds. Um, so in the meantime I got the pump mounted. This is the negative that'll mount back here. 
and then the positive gets isolated. So there's a little washer in there that isolates this uh, power from the uh, rest of the chassis of this thing. So let's get the uh, terminal ends installed. I put this little anti-chafing sleeve on here. So as this wire comes around the side, it doesn't fall pour up there. Just to add further confirmation, I uh, hooked this up to the 12 volt power source and it turned on perfect. And I hooked this one, the old one, up to the 12 volt power source and nothing happened. So that's pretty much 100% confirmation that it was our fuel pump. So we're going to get this installed back in the car and uh, hopefully she'll drive now. Jeez. So I have the new fuel pump installed and the tank just hanging right now. I really just want to hear and make sure that the fuel pump kicks on. So I'm going to put in the key and hope for the best. Ooh, now I hear something running. Can hear the pump just primed. Let's see what we got. Give it a sec. A little bit of gas. And now we're gonna have a dead battery. And the battery's dead. All right, so I'm just gonna back my truck up and I'll get this jump, let's see. All right, let's try this again. I never like these GM connections. I feel like they never they make a good contact. Healthier. You need a little, little starter fluid to Help it out too. And not enough battery. All right, so I may have to charge that battery overnight again. But the good thing is I heard the fuel pump prime this time. So I at least know that that has made a connection and that the relays aren't bad and it was just a pump, hopefully just a pump. Um, Give this one more shot. Hey, we're on it. We're not on it. Hey, 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 hey. Uh. All right. Well. Pretty sure it got fuel pressure now, I can hear it. Really wants to run now. I feel like 
maybe we need some choking in here. Let's put that on for now. Ah, oh, I can hear it really just wants to run. Still no good. Let's uh, get this battery on the charger. All right, we're gonna give this one more shot without the battery because I realized that the tank didn't have any gas in it. So, oh, look at that. Hey, we run. Go, baby, go. Let's pedal into the metal on it, baby. This is gonna be a very good one. Far, like road for her? Why not? I don't know. You're not gonna be able to get out of anybody's way. We can fix that. So it's not though. It does. I also have the back open, uh -huh. so that's probably part of the reason. I mean the air's kinda Just zero cool to that air. It doesn't feel that weird driving on the side of the road. Doesn't it? It's weird. It's like so. kind of easy. Yeah. Then here we are a couple days later and the car won't start again. Uh, this time I think it might have been my fault. I didn't really clean the tank out that well when I reassembled everything. But at this point I'm not sure if it's because there's debris in the tank or if the fuel pump is actually faulty. I've seen cars run on worse tanks so I didn't think it'd be a problem. So once again I lower the very heavy and full tank. I pull out the pump and I inspect it and I bench test it but it doesn't seem like there's any debris in there. So I think that the pump just may be faulty. But the pump I ordered had a lifetime warranty so I ordered a replacement. At the same time, I also ordered a slightly cheaper backup option. It was still for a Hayabusa, just a $40 pump instead of an $80 pump. Since the cheaper one got to me first, and I was afraid I might ruin the good one again, I just installed that one. So now I have the expensive Hayabusa one as a backup. If it happens again, I'll make sure to get the tank properly cleaned and dipped. This time around, I just cleaned it out as best I could with some descaler. And once it was cleaned, I put some Marvel Mystery Oil in there to help prevent re-rusting. I drove it around locally for a little bit to a couple car shows and back and forth to the shop. And so far it's running longer than the first pump did. So I'm pretty confident it was just a faulty pump the first time. So I'm enjoying the car one day out driving and the car stalls and dies. About a mile from my tattoo shop. So I'm stuck in the middle of the road. Luckily it was a Sunday and not too much traffic so I pushed it that mile to the shop. I 100% don't recommend that as it was in the middle of the summer and I almost died. I'm pretty sure it was the pump again this time, it just won't fire up, but this time starter fluid won't get it going. So this might be indicative of some other problem, but I think it's the pump again. This time I bring it over my buddy Timmy's shop at Avenue Imports and he can start looking it over. The fuel tank is completely filled with gas and I don't really want to try to drain it out again in my driveway. He starts looking into it, he finds that they're getting pressure and it doesn't seem to be the pump. The injectors are firing and everything seems fine, but he's getting a choppy spark. I had already ordered spark plugs for it when I was ordering the pump, so next we tried the cap and rotor. The cap wasn't too bad, but the rotor for this model was kind of hard to find. The distributor in this model is slightly different from the Suzuki Carry that I own. We ended up getting a distributor cap from a Geo Metro Turbo. And I think that was where I ended up ultimately getting the rotor from as well. Suzuki partnered with GM back in the 90s, so the Geos and the Suzukis share a lot of parts. In fact, if you ever look closely at a Suzuki Sidekick and a Geo Tracker, you might notice some similarity. They're basically the same car. So we try to put the cap and rotor on and then Timmy's mechanic noticed that the igniter in the distributor is actually just toasted. The copper wire is all ripped out and wrapped around the distributor shaft. I have no idea how this happened. It's probably just a 27 year old part given up. So we look up the part number and here's another major roadblock. This part is not available anywhere and there's no interchange information. I may be able to find a used one with a similar part number or the right part number from Japan, but there's no guarantee that that one's not just as broken and it's not cheap either. I didn't want to really risk the time and the money lost. So after doing some digging, Timmy took a chance and ordered an igniter off that same model Geo Metro Turbo. The part that came looked almost identical, it just had a different connector on it. This was a cheap, low risk purchase, this way they could install it and see if it starts. It does start, but now just sometimes. It's kind of unreliable. It was starting once or twice every three or four times. 
so something's still not right. Now, Timmy's shop deals with a lot of European cars that have a lot of quirks. His mechanic at one point thought that maybe the computer was looking for a very specific ohm from the igniter, and the Geo Metro one is just sending out some different information. But that seems a little too advanced for this car. So maybe the whole distributor is toast. But the Metro won't save us this time, it's a different unit. So now the real hunt begins. I either need to find a new correct igniter, or a new or rebuilt distributor. Suzuki no longer makes any of these parts, and all the parts supplier in Japan are all sold out of them. I ended up finding two rebuilt distributors. One of them was 280 bucks, but they wouldn't ship it to the United States, period. I might be able to ship it to a buddy in Japan, but they wouldn't sell it to him without a core return. So I'd have to ship mine out to him, and then he'd have to buy the new one, lay out the extra core charge, then they'd send it back to him after they received the new one, and then he'd have to ship me the other one. This seemed like a big pain in the ass. The other one was $590. They would ship it to the United States, but they also wanted the core first. I didn't really want to be out of the car for that long, and I didn't really want to spend that kind of money shipping stuff back and forth, on top of the $590 for the part. I mean, shit, the whole car itself was only $1,700. Well, a little more once I got it here, but you get the idea. It was a lot of money for it. So we started researching alternatives. I would find some similar looking distributors across Suzuki's other cars, but they wouldn't quite be right. They'd either have different mounting ears, or they'd be different heights, or they'd have just different internals. None of the other cars that use this engine seem to use the same distributor as my 96 Every Turbo. From what I hear, this is a common issue with Suzuki, making little tweaks along the way. So even if they share a lot of the platform, and the engines are all F6As, there are enough differences between a Carry and an Every and an Alta Works and a Cappuccino and so on, uh, you might get lucky with some interchangeable parts, or you might just be screwed. So I found some used, non-rebuilt distributors on a site as well, but without knowing if the part is good or not, it seemed like it might just be a waste of time to buy it. So while looking for some parts on eBay, I caught a Geo Metro distributor that kind of looked similar. And the guy selling them had tons of Suzuki and Geo parts, so it seemed like he might be knowledgeable in Suzuki's. So I sent him a message, and he got back in touch with me. And after talking with him for a bit, he said there's absolutely no way the computer cares what the ohms are that are coming into it. The Metro part we bought should have worked, so there was something else that was happening. He said there was some precision to the gapping on the rotor and the cap, since the igniter is also kind of acting as a trigger wheel on this model. But he doubted that it was the ultimate cause. And Tim's mechanic started to suspect that the faulty fuel pump and or the igniter may have caused some problems upstream back to the computer. So we pulled the computer out and got a whiff of it, and you could smell the dreaded burnt electronics. So now we're relatively sure that the computer is toast. So now we're back at parts research. Luckily at this point I hadn't bought a new distributor, so we only lost a little bit of time and effort going down that rabbit hole. So now I start going through the process of looking up the computer's part number. Now I know I wasn't going to be able to find a brand new one, but the right part popped up pretty quick. I found a used replacement that was pulled from a running vehicle on Yahoo Auctions Japan. I used a company called Bai, who acts as Japan's local recipient, and once you purchase it, the seller ships it to Bai in Japan, and then Bai ships it to me, at an additional cost, of course. I think the computer is about 3,300 yen plus tax, which comes out to be about $23 right now. The yen is really weak. Then Bai's service fee brings it up to about $28 US. The cost to ship it to Bai was 1,800 yen, and then from Bai to me was 3,500 yen, which is a total of about 5,300 yen, which again right now is about $37. So I'm into the computer for about 60 bucks. And from the time that I purchased it on the auction site and that it actually got shipped to me from Bayi was about a week, week and a half. I handed the computer off to Tim and his mechanics and once they installed it, the car fired right up. We still had to make a couple of adjustments on the cap and rotor, but we replaced the spark plugs while we were in there too. And at the same time, I developed a leaky radiator cap, which I actually was able to get off Amazon this time the part number was wrong, but it was the correct pressure and the right size. So holy crap, what a difference. The car is really actually kind of peppy now. It's a little slow off the line, but once the turbo gets going, it's got pretty decent acceleration. That's a turbo. So with this whole process, the car was down for about four months. Which sounds crazy, but really it was because I wasn't doing the work on the car myself, and Timmy was kind of backlogged at his shop. And they would just work on it from time to time while we were researching which parts we actually needed for the car. So what does this all mean? Well, as expected, some parts were really easy to source and others were a real pain in the ass. And to track down some of these parts, you're not necessarily going to have to learn Japanese or make a Japanese friend, but 
It also might not hurt. Ultimately, if you're gonna own one of these cars, whether you spend a lot or a little, when problems happen, you're just gonna to have to be patient and do a lot of research. I recommend joining a Facebook or a forum group of the other owners, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Someone out there has probably had the same problem as you, and hopefully they're willing to share their expertise. So let me know in the comments below what your experience is with finding parts. Have you had similar trouble finding part numbers? Or has everything gone smoothly? Or is this the one thing that's stopping you from purchasing one of these imported cars? Anyway, that's it for now. Kiki's back on the road, and I'm going to see you again soon with a video about my recent trip to Japan. And how I got to visit one of the exporters I've been dealing with, and my awesome experience hanging out with them. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.